I'm mic'd up. Can you all hear me? Good. I said we want lapel mics. The idea is that we can interrupt each other. We can have a spontaneous discussion. Well, I hope you're all um, enjoying the conference, gaining inspiration and energy from these discussions, meeting up with old friends and making new ones. This final panel focuses on one of our most fraught issues, the language we use and how we communicate with each other. As most of you will know, our announced fourth panellist, Simon Edge, has sadly had a close encounter of a Doberman kind, <laughs> and he's laid up in bed with a splint on his leg. We're very sorry he can't be with us, and so is he. If you haven't read his great satirical novels, The End of the World is Flat and The Beginning, I can warmly recommend them, and I know I, I, you can join me all in wishing him a very speedy recovery. <laughs> Fortunately, our fantastic keynote speaker, Andrew Doyle, agreed to take Simon's place at the last minute to join this discussion on language, and we're very grateful to him for agreeing to do so. So language can be used in so many ways, um, ranging from maybe poetry at the extreme end of creativ creativity, um, to the instructions for how to assemble an IKEA cupboard, <laughs> which doesn't work for me, but anyway, uh, at the other end. Within fiction, writers of, say, science fiction and fantasy can create new words and use words in new ways to create new universes. It's marvellous. And though we suspend disbelief when we read their stories, we never f completely forget that we're in a fictional world. But we might say, and I think Kathleen Stock has made this point, that what we're grappling with now is a section of society that is using these fictional techniques in real life to recreate or redefine the material world. These are people who used their preferred meanings of words, and several speakers have already touched on this, as, as a kind of clay from which to fashion the world they want and seek to impose their worldview on the rest of us. It affects everyone. At LGB Alliance, of course, we are particularly concerned by how it affects people with same-sex sexual orientation. You know, that long phrase I have to use these days so that people know that I'm talking about gays and lesbians and bisexuals. <laughs> it threatens the equal rights that we thought were secure. We know what our sexual orientation means in our lives, and some of us find ourselves going back to the stuffy old world homosexual to make it clear. Uh, although, in various dictionaries, we find that even the word homosexuality has been redefined in terms of gender, although we also see a fight back from that. On sex and gender issues, people are speaking different languages or using words in contradictory ways. But without agreed meanings, we cannot communicate, never mind about no debate, we can't talk at all if we're not using the same language. Ordinary words like safe, hate, and less ordinary words like genocide, for heaven's sake, are used in weird new ways. Inclusive is used to mean the opposite of what it really means. Then there's a word that has no clear meaning but is simply used to stop any discussion at all. And that word is, of course, transphobic. <coughs> the question is how to extricate ourselves from this situation. How can we get back to a common language? Each of the panellists speaking today speaks in a personal capacity. They do not represent any organisation or LGB Alliance. They may disagree with each other, and that is OK. If there's one thing we stand for at LGB Alliance, it's the ability to engage in respectful disagreement. Now, I know how important some people find it these days to feel reassured that they are in a safe space. <laughs> A place where they will not hear anything they might find offensive. <laughs> so I would like to assure everyone, this discussion will not be a safe space. <laughs> the panellists may, for instance, have different views on the language we should use, whether it's justifiable to use the language of war, the war on women, the war against gay people, or whether we should always be looking for compromises, be more conciliatory. It's partly about how you define your goals, I suppose. 
but it's also about your place of work. Freelancers have far more freedom than those who are employed, um, for instance, by university. And we've got examples of both on this panel. So without further ado, let me introduce my great panellists. Starting on my left with Holly Lawford-Smith from Australia. <laughs> I'm going to, um, Holly, I'm going to introduce everyone first, if that's all right. Okay, I'll just wait here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Holly Lawford-Smith is a philosopher, a gender-critical feminist and a lesbian. She works as an associate professor in political philosophy at the University of Melbourne, lecturing on everyday ethics, feminism, the connection between metaphysics and ethics, and free speech. Her last two books, both published with Oxford University Press, were Gender Critical Feminism in 2022 and Sex Matters, Essays in Gender Critical Philosophy in 2023, just out. She writes a monthly column for Quillette and along with philosopher Kate Phelan, co-hosts the YouTube channel Feminist Heretics. Then here we have um, Joe Bartosz. Joe Bartosz was one of the first journalists to question the medical protocols around the transition of children and has been a key figure in the fight against transgenderism by bringing it to national attention in the press. She's been published in outlets from The Times to The New Statesman and is a frequent contributor to broadcasts on political topics. Jo is assistant editor at The Critic and a regular contributor to Spiked. And then I'll, you can... <laughs> her war-torn Joe Phoenix. <laughs> Joe is Professor of Criminology at the University of Reading. <laughs> Reading. She researches youth justice, sex, gender, sexualities, crime and justice. She believes passionately in democratic discussion and the need for robust academic debate. She was unlawfully cancelled by the University of Essex, which later offered a public apology for its unlawful actions. And she co-founded the Open University Gender Critical Research Network with Dr. John Pike. And in that connection, she's just been through a gruelling 15-day employment tribunal hearing in her case against the Open University for failure to protect her from the harassment and bullying of her colleagues. And somehow, she is with us today. <laughs> Of course, Andrew Doyle gave this uh, fantastic um, keynote address, needs no further introduction. So welcome to this fantastic panel. I really feel it's a privilege to have all four of you here. Um, and um, we, we have um, set the chairs up in, in a slight circle to encourage them to engage with each other so I can shut up. I hope this will work. <laughs> Um, and um, so I'd like you all to give a brief introduction to where you stand in our current struggles in the world of language. And Holly, perhaps you can kick it off. Thanks. OK, so uh, language is important uh, and there are words we need in order to pursue our politics. Um, but language is also not as important as some people think. And that's what I want to talk about in these opening remarks, the topic of which uh, I'm conceiving as something like words versus the world. So there's an apocryphal tale attributed to Abraham Lincoln, which goes something like this. Lincoln asks a person, how many legs would a dog have if we called the dog's tail a leg? The person confidently replies, five. And Lincoln replies, no, calling a dog's tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. <laughs> this story is annoying because the person is just going along with the new language rule. Uh, we don't distinguish between legs and tails anymore. We call them all legs. And according to this rule, there are five legs. Lincoln's point is that while there might be five legs, there are still only four legs. So think of this distinction as inside quote marks and outside quote marks. The quote marks show we're talking about a word or a concept, and lack of quote marks show we're talking about the thing in the world. 
Lincoln's point applies all across the clash between gender identity activism and LGB people's and women's sex-based rights activism. Some obvious places it shows up are with the word sex and the thing in the world, biological sex, the word woman and the thing in the world, things in the world, women, and the word lesbian and the things in the world, lesbians. Just as Lincoln declared that we shall call the dog's tail a leg, gender identity activism declares that we shall call some men women, call some gender identity or gender expression sex, and call some heterosexual men lesbians. And just as calling a tail a leg doesn't make it a leg, calling a man a woman doesn't make him a woman, calling gender identity or gender expression sex doesn't make it sex, and calling a heterosexual man a lesbian doesn't make him a lesbian. <laughs> but what if we are like Lincoln's interlocutor and we go along with the new language rules? There is something at stake here, but there's also not as much at stake as some people seem to think. Postmodernists who think there is only language and that language constructs the world will of course see adoption of the new language rules as a huge victory because for them that is all there is. There isn't a real world underneath being incorrectly described or referred to. But most of us, thank God, are not postmodernists. <laughs> When we use their words, we might be making it a little harder for others not to, but we're not literally constructing the things that matter, like biological sex, women, and lesbians, out of existence. The very worst that can happen is that the meaning of a word changes over time, so that there is no word at all to refer to a thing that very much remains in the world. If we don't need to talk about that thing anymore, then we might not develop a new word. But if any practical purposes remain at all, then new words will emerge to refer to the thing that we still need to talk about. Someone might worry, can't we lose a thing in the world for good because we lose the language to talk about it? And I have to say, I think the answer to this question is no, at least in the long term. So as John Stuart Mill pointed out in On Liberty, the truth has tremendous advantage over falsehood and that it has ever so many more chances to emerge. So what he wrote was, the real advantage which truth has consists in this, that when an opinion is true, it may be extinguished once, twice, or many times, but in the course of ages, there will generally be found persons to rediscover it until some one of its reappearances falls on a time when from favorable circumstances it escapes persecution until it has made such head as to withstand all subsequent attempts to suppress it. Precisely because it is the truth, people will rediscover it independently at different moments in time. So even if we have the most insane language policing authoritarianism about sex and sex-linked words and concepts for the next 100 years, there will still be someone say in the 102nd year, who makes an interesting discovery about the different categories of persons within gender identities that seem to carve nature at its joints. The conditions will then be ripe for sex to re-enter the lexicon and our common understanding and mean sex again. Thanks. Thank you uh, very much, Holly. I think we were all uh, first, first relieved that there's not so much at stake and then quite horrified about, perhaps about the time that this, all this might take. <laughs> but um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'd like uh, um, Joe Bartosz to, to, to carry on. And would you like to yeah, speak now? I'm, I'm yeah, we're, we're each going to... So. You don't have to go up there if you don't want to. <laughs> Good, because it will just swamp me, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, shall I just... I'll, I'll crack on then. So, I want to start by... Um, asking you all to fuck, be kind. <laughs> because, particularly for those of us now known as cervix havers, the language of be kind has become a gag, silencing us as a vocal minority of bullies have trampled over our rights. And leading this charge, 
those at the apex of the victimhood pyramid, are people who claim to be trans, a group apparently so fragile that language and perceptions of reality itself must be restructured to avoid causing them offence. This attack on language, on definitions, is an attack on truth. 70 years ago, Har Hannah Arendt, which I can never say, <laughs> um, observed that the ideal subject of, the, of totalitarian rule was not the political ideologue, but rather people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction and the distinction between true and false no longer exist. So today, please to be kind have emptied words of meaning, replacing objective reality with subjective fantasy. And for me, learning to see the truth, learning to see and then tell the truth about transgenderism started with questions. So don't be afraid to ask what living as a woman actually means. To ask why Eddie Izzard is now claiming to be transgender rather than a transvestite and what the bloody hell the difference is. And to ask what non-binary means anyway. And I think all of us in this room Boldly asking such questions, demanding definitions, and recognising that the truth is bigger than any one individual is how we will win. And there are multiple answers as to who might benefit from pretending that men and women are merely linguistic categories, from reducing mothers to gestational carriers, from making the word homosexual a slur. Looking to the future, pulling away each individual from the material, from the bonds which root them in families and communities, and incubating fear and distrust of the outside world will make some people a lot of money. So suffice it to say, there are many what Donald Rumsfeld might have called uh, unknown unknowns lurking here. But right now, the most obvious beneficiaries are to be found in the grievance industry, the hectoring experts who infest human resources departments. The business model that props up parasites like Stonewall depends upon, employee, depends upon telling employees and even school students that we are sinful, that we are racist, ableist, or any variety of phobic. And a new lexicon of approved vocabulary is central to this project. Mad, unprovable threats hang in workplaces, from microaggressions to so-called misgendering. And as many of us here know, this is, of course, a gift to bullies. But make no mistake, linguistic demands are not about being accommodating to a minority. They are a way of establishing a hierarchy. And just as an elite around dinner tables would have once sneer at those who said serviette instead of napkin, a new ruling class claimed that definitions are complex and subjective. The rules are bewildering and opaque to those who have not been taught the correct phrases, and those who resist are told to educate themselves. And it's hard not to be impressed with the audacity of this, because as with every other facet of the reality-denying cult of transgenderism, the call to educate oneself is a horrifying reversal. It is a demand to suspend reason, to choose ignorance, to be kind. Such reversals characterise the grievance industry. Safe and inclusive spaces, as Bev said earlier, um, only exist to exclude and threaten people with unfashionable opinions, and diversity now does indeed mean sameness. And we are constantly told that these linguistic changes are meant to protect the vulnerable, to prevent harm. We are warned that words themselves can be acts of violence. Now, paradoxically, this has in some cases turned out to be true, because as mad and meaningless definitions have been embraced by institutions and written into law, the truly vulnerable have suffered. Women prisoners have found themselves incarcerated alongside violent men. <coughs> Rape victims have been left without support, and confused young people are being experimented upon and sterilised. Language is what makes us human. Our ability to communicate outside of ourselves, to share a common understanding, and to structure our thoughts. And when words become subjective, these most fundamental bonds are broken. So make no mistake, what's happening here is an all-out assault on the truth, and what it is to be human. But the good news is that the power to resist is in our hands, or rather, it's in our words. As same-sex attracted people, most of us have had those difficult conversations, which essentially, by virtue of coming out, most of us have indirectly had to tell our nearest and dearest about our sex lives. So, <laughs> as lesbians, gays and bisexuals, we are perfectly placed to push back. So when your manager tells you to add pronouns to your email signature, 
Ask what the benefit is and to whom. When your well-meaning friend has a sharp intake of breath at the mention of J.K. Rowling, ask, <laughs> ask if they know what she's said or done wrong. When your self-righteous nephew froths about a transgenocide, ask for proof and make him realise how <laughs> offensive such baseless claims are. As with all conflict, truth has been the first victim of the culture war, and words are the key to its resurrection. But the first step is for us to refuse to be manipulated. So I ask you all again to fuck be kind. <laughs> Well, a very warlike statement there from, uh, from Joe, and I'm sure we'll come back to that um, and uh, challenge maybe some of that maybe later. Um, yes, go ahead, Joe. Hi, everyone. My name's Joe. My pronouns are materially based. <laughs> I don't know how to follow those two speakers, so uh, I'm, I've got a kind of few words to say, uh, and I want to start with a happy note before I descend into less happy things. Um, and the happy note is this. I think human beings are some of the most extraordinary creatures there ever were. We are symbolic world makers. Every time we talk, we create a whole new universe. Now, for the most part, uh, that communication has always been fragile. Symbolic communication is always fragile, and it always has been. So we have a lot of conversations, don't we, uh, generally, about what we mean by what we say. Um, and you know, particularly within the academy, uh, we spend an awful lot of time trying to define our concepts and our terms of reference, and all of that is fine, um, absolutely fine. Um, so I'm going to kind of take a step back from some of the concepts around sex, gender, and gender identity, and I want to talk about my bete noir word, if you like. That word is harm, right? Um, I have a real thing about the word harm. I have a, a, an ambivalent relationship with that word because that word has done tremendous good, right? particularly within my discipline. Um, if we think it, I'm a criminologist for those who don't know. I'm actually a sociologist, but I pretend to be a criminologist. <laughs> Sounds sexier. Um, <laughs> Now, within criminology, uh, certainly from the 70s and 80s onwards, when we're talking about women's struggles for uh, justice and equality, we had to force legislators and you know, politicians and other people to recognize that the harms that women were experiencing, particularly things like rape and sexual violence, were a thing called a crime. Right? So we used the language of harm, we used it on purpose, and we tried to expand the definition of crime from just being what's illegal in law to cover injurious, uh, harmful, violent um, behavior and conduct to others. So for me, the word harm is actually a very important one, um, or at least it was for a long time. Uh, but we fast forward in time, and what we see is that same use of the language of harm um, and what it means uh, to do almost the obverse of what it was set out to be. I just want to read you this. I'm allowed to read you this. I've cleared it with my lawyer, all right? <laughs> there are some things I'm not allowed to talk about. <laughs> so uh, shortly after, uh, myself and John Pike and Laura McGrath founded the Open University Gender, Gender Critical Research Network, um, this statement went up on the Open University's central web page. Um, and it was also put up on their news page, right? So it went to the world. Um, it was published to the world. And it said this, the Open University is being tested given the strengths of the views and the levels of distress uh, caused by the establishment of the OU Gender Critical Research Network. This research network has caused hurt and a feeling of being abandoned amongst trans and non-binary and gender non-conforming staff and students. It has distressed many others. Right. There's a lot more in that statement, uh, dated 24th of June, 2021, uh, by the Vice Chancellor, Tim Blackman. Now, at that point, I knew that the word harm had become something actually uh, to shut down academic debate. Um, it was... Um, used in a fashion that was dislocated from any of its radical struggle 
previously, um, because the word there uh, ended up being the same as offence, right? Or indeed even disagreement. So in that one statement, what you see is the kind of complete mashing together of everything to do with, I don't like this idea, it makes me feel uncomfortable, I may be offended by the ideas, um, I may actually be distressed by them in my head, I may disagree with them, and then suddenly it gets turned into something uh, that it really, really wasn't. Um, so I'm not going to talk uh, at length here. What I want to suggest to you is that when we're talking about why language matters in the fight for equality, we get, we, in my mind, we get a little bit stuck on sex and gender when we have to look at some of the other words that surround this struggle because they are being used in a way that absolutely undercut the demands of equality. And I just want to talk about four, or not talk, but mention four specific words that seem to fall right into each other that aren't uh, sufficiently distinguished. Harm, offense, conflict, and abuse. Right? Those words now, the meaning of them seems to blur one into the other. And the challenge that we have here is that the second that you start talking about harm, rather than, say, offense or disagreement, you have an injunction to act. Right? If I say to you, I am harmed by a targeted campaign of harassment and bullying, um, one would assume that one's employer would act. Right? But if you have sufficiently, I'm not saying anything there, just glossing over. <laughs> so but if you have sufficient number of people saying we are harmed by these very ideas in a university, when what they mean is we disagree with them, um, then what you have uh, comes back to what Simon Fanshawe was talking about earlier. We're supposed to be talking to the functions of the organization in a university. The function is idea, discussion, and debate. Uh, and as soon as you start seeing distress and harm being used instead of disagreement or even conflict, um, then you actually foreclose that space altogether. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you. <laughs> the topic of emotional manipulation um, is something that we're definitely going to come back to because it's another way of just stopping people talking. Many, many of the things that everybody has been talking to up to now are just ways of stopping other people saying what they think. Andrew. Yeah, um, on that, uh, I had direct experience of that a number of years ago. I was, I was running a stand-up comedy course for young uh, aspiring stand-ups between the ages of 20 and 26 at the Soho Theatre in London. Uh, that came to an abrupt end because... Um, one of the members of the group complained uh, to the theatre that a joke that I had posted on Twitter made her feel unsafe. Now, of course, had she said, uh, you know, I didn't like the joke, I was offended by the joke, they would have said, well, it's a comedy course, so get over it. <laughs> but because they'd invoked safety, I could, my contract was not renewed. So that, but that's how it works. So it's a tactic. It's a similar tactic to smearing uh, decent people as fascist because then it disobliges you from having to talk to them. So actually, language is incredibly important. And the reason why it's so important in this uh, particular area uh, that we are concentrating on is because uh, many of these ideas that have led to the, the, the situation that I discussed earlier um, have come about because of the rise of postmodernism. And as has been mentioned by Holly, postmodernism is the belief that our understanding of reality is constructed wholly through language. And that's why it's important. When I was at university and I was studying, uh, for my doctorate, I was studying early modern uh, discourses of sexuality within poetry largely, and it was just an accepted point that everyone agreed that the concept of the homosexual, homosexuality did not exist until the word was created in late 19th century medical discourses. <laughs> so until you got this sort of Latin Greek compound emerging, there was no such thing as a homosexual. But, now that is false. <laughs> it is not true, but every academic I spoke to, every conference I went to, they all just accepted this falsehood because it was the, the fashionable falsehood to accept. Now, that's really interesting to me. But I was studying a poet called Richard Barnfield. If you read Richard Barnfield's love sonnets, this is a man expressing his inherent tendency to be same-sex attracted through love poetry, right? In it, with, with the exception of William Shakespeare, there are no other male writers of that period writing love sonnets to another man. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day is from one man to another, in case you don't know. 
Now, the, so the point of this is that there, were, there are ways that people express their inherent sexual orientation without that word, homosexual. That's just an absolute nonsense. But I want to just, before I finish, I just want to link this, and I want to make my case that the reason it's so important for this debate against the activists that we're currently up against is because the woke movement is an essentially authoritarian movement, and throughout history, one of the chief weapons of tyrants has been to control the speech that people are allowed to use. If you've read 1984, you'll know this is absolutely the case. They developed a new language, the party developed a new language called Newspeak, because if you can limit uh, how people can speak, you can control them. There's a quotation I wrote down here from Philip K. Dick, who said, the basic tool for the manipulation of reality is the manipulation of words. If you can control the meaning of words, you can control the people who must use the words. Now, I think that when activists redefine terms and deny that they are redefining them at the same time, it creates a kind of deranging effect. And it means that we are unable to proceed in any meaningful sense. It is why activists are attracted to those jobs in libraries, for instance, or online dictionaries, where they can change the definitions of words. Merriam-Webster has done this again and again, so the, which is the oldest online dictionary, I believe. You know, they change the definition of racism which we all understand as being hatred or prejudice towards people on the basis of race. And they modified that definition so it was to do with power structures in society. In other words, they implemented an ideological view of racism which does not match the general understanding of it. The role of the dictionary is to record common usage. And what activists do is they infiltrate the online dictionaries and change the definitions not to reflect online usage, but to reflect what they would like the words to mean in the hope that they can change the world as a result. Now, Holly made the very good point that, that it shouldn't matter because most people understand the difference between the signifier and the signified, between the word and what the word means. The problem is that because those, uh, those of a postmodernist mindset have such clout in the media and in our major institutions, it does have an impact. To give you an example, when uh, during the Black Lives Matter protests, when, uh, was it CNN, I think, uh, did a report from Kenosha, Wisconsin, saying that this is a mostly peaceful protest. <laughs> and behind the reporter, there were burning cars and buildings. <laughs> that signifies a couple of things. I mean, one of the, I mean, firstly, what's quite reassuring is that it got roundly mocked because we could see it wasn't peaceful. But it signifies something about the mindset of the reporter and the channel. They believe that if you describe something as mostly peaceful, then it is mostly peaceful. In other words, the reality doesn't matter. But how you describe the reality creates the reality. And that's the mindset we're dealing with. So when John Hopkins University, uh, for its LGBT glossary, this was in June, they define uh, a lesbian as a non-man attracted to other non-men. <laughs> that's not trivial. They're doing something there. They're attempting to change the power dynamics. They're attempting to impose an idea on the rest of us. So we really have to think very carefully about the language that we use and the strategic impact of the language that we use. But ultimately, clarity is the most important thing because whatever words we come up with, the activists will try to problematize those words and redefine those words. Just, I'll just quickly give one more example. I know I'm overrunning, but the word woke is a really good example. So up until a few years ago, activists were describing themselves as woke. <coughs> Jack Dorsey went on stage at a conference with a Stay Woke t-shirt. Nika Burns, who is the head of the uh, Edinburgh Comedy Awards, gave a speech launching the Edinburgh Comedy Festival in 2018, saying, we are looking forward to the new woke world where woke comedians will be setting the parameters of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. That, by the way, coming from the head of the comedy industry, leading figure, that's like an edict. That's why comedy is so bad, because people followed that edict, right? She was basically saying, if you want to be successful, you've got to do this. But no one at the time said, why is she using the word woke? That's a right-wing slur. Why is she using that word? No one ever said that, because these people self-identified as woke. But now they've redefined words and history and said that people using the word woke are just right-wingers using a snarl word. It's a slur, forgetting that five minutes ago they were using it to describe themselves. <laughs> because in tandem to the redefinition of words, we are dealing with a group of people who revise history as it's going. We have to be very careful of that. Uh, that's all I've got to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um...
really important, um, all, all these uh, contributions really important. And because of the, because most of us don't, I think, want to be in conflict every single minute of the day, either at home or at work or, uh, or on social media, um, we thought it would be interesting to ask us, our subscribers um, to what extent they self-censor. So we put a little poll up. Can you put the poll up, the questions that we asked our um, subscribers about their self-censoring? Poll, please. There we go. So do you um, self-censor at work? And we find that two-thirds of people do. So they don't do what Joe Bartosz wants us to do, but, <laughs> but Joe is perhaps freer than those who are employed at an institution. So, you know, this is... Um, I, I'm going to ask you all in, in a minute what you think about this self-censoring. But um, And then, so, do you self-censor at work? Two-thirds do. And then the next question we asked was, do you self-censor on social media? And there you see it's over 70%. Who do, and that's not surprising because everybody knows if you put one little foot. You know this uh, this lovely little meme on social media, which is this baby that goes goes to the doorway and says one word wrong, or, or likes a tweet or something, and then this huge onslaught comes, and they whoa, and they they go back and say, "I'm terribly sorry. I absolutely adore the LGBTQIA two spirit community, and I, I completely inadvertently used this word when I was drunk or, or something, and I will never use it again." You know these hostage states. Anyway, so it's not surprising that people self-censor on social media. And then we also asked them whether they self-censor um, in your personal life. And, and even there, slightly over half. So, I mean, um, so Joe Bartish is very fierce. Polly much less so. Um, I think Joe and Andrew somewhere in between. But um, do you self-censor? And if so... Is that sort of preventing us <coughs> from, um, from, from moving forward? Should, should we do less of it? I, I'll start with you, Holly. Well, I mostly do not self-censor uh, at work or on social media, um, and I think that's because I'm protected by academic freedom, but um, my university has a compelled speech policy for pronouns, so that's the exception. Uh, you make a strategic decision whether to self, uh, I mean, is it self-sensitive? Yeah, what I would prefer is to not use preferred pronouns or not have to. Well, you said to um, me that you also thought it was respectful. Yeah, that's true. I think in, a, in my own classroom, um, the way that it would be received if I insisted on sex-based pronouns would be very alienating to the students in question. So I don't necessarily feel like... Um, super angry about that policy, but I do have to make a choice about giving the uni grounds to fire me, which they love to do. <laughs> and so I feel like it thwarts them more if I just go along with that rule. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks. So you, 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 I suppose you don't, do you, Joe? Well, <coughs> I mean, I, 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 I guess that's probably why I'm totally unemployable, to be honest. <laughs> Um, it just doesn't, I, it just, I don't understand why people do it. I mean, you know, Maya for starters did the hard work for us. She took a case to court. That means that we now all have the right to our gender critical views and to express those. And I genuinely... <laughs> I mean, it seems a bit ridiculous to sit on a panel like this and apologise for my privilege, but maybe I should apologise because, yes, I suppose, you know, as a freelance, no, it doesn't really matter to me. But at the same time, it's... I, I, if, if it's about politeness, I think there's nothing um, uh, ruder than being disingenuous. There's nothing ruder than lying. And um, I, I think people just need to fucking find their spines. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose... Um... You're reminding us all of Magdalene Burns, it is not hateful to speak the truth. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid, Bev, I can't answer that question until I speak to my lawyer. For <laughs> what a cop out! No, but it's true. I no, at the moment it is. However, the day that I am unmuzzled will be fun. Oh, we, oh, we will all look forward. And I won't. We all look forward to the unmuzzling of Joe. Andrew? <laughs> Uh, 
no, I don't self-censor. I think, but I think coming from the comedy world, that is the biggest problem within the comedy world at the moment is that virtually everybody does. So, and I don't Ricky think... Ricky Gervais, I, maybe, I don't know. Ricky Gervais does not, but Ricky Gervais is um, a hugely <coughs> successful multi-billionaire who cannot be cancelled, mm. right? So, um, and, I, and that's not to say I don't admire him for not self-censoring, I do, because a lot of people in his position do anyway. Yeah. Um, so I think it's great that he doesn't. Um, and I think he's brilliant. But, but um, most comedians have, as I mentioned the Nika Burns speech, most comedians are aware that if they don't self-censor, they will not get on the panel shows, they'll not get booked. And so what you happen is a kind of immiseration of the arts, generally. It's not just... Uh, the comedy, it's theatre and TV and, and novels and everything else. And so self-censorship, I think, is the major threat at the moment. But I, I'd be interested in what Joe thinks, because I think there should be a distinction between self-censorship and choosing our words with care for strategic reasons. And I think civility is actually strategically really sound when it comes to this argument. So I don't know what Joe thinks about that. Well... I suppose when it, when it <laughs> I mean, I, I suppose it was, what's, what's your job, really? I mean, you know, I, I suppose if, if your job is, um, is persuasion, if you're in PR or something, then perhaps there's a case to be made for that. Otherwise, no, I think the, the basic guideline should be honesty. Yeah. No, no, I'm not... But I'm not talking about dishonesty. Yeah. I'm talking about... Uh, so, so, dishonesty, I think, is where you frame <coughs> language in such a way as to obscure the meaning of what it is you're talking about. Governments do it all the time. The Tory government used to call welfare, cuts to welfare services efficiency savings, <laughs> or, the, or the CIA calling torture enhanced interrogation. <laughs> right, so stuff like that, I think, is a means to manipulate language, to manipulate what you think they're actually talking about. But I think when I'm talking about civility, it means expressing yourself in such a way, you know, I think one of the reasons why we've come so far in, in, on Turf Island is because... <laughs> People outside this debate, which is most people, look at what's going on online, and they look at all the rape threats and death threats that come in daily to J.K. Rowling and to feminists, and they look on the other side and realise you never see rape and death threats coming from the other side. It doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, and so, therefore, they're, they're presented with those who are being taking the moral high ground and being, to a degree, civil, and those who are being, uh, using language in this brutal, aggressive way, and people, because most people are just decent, want to side with, with one side over the other. So I think, I think there's a way to be honest but strategic so that we end up winning over all of those people who are somewhere in the middle. That's, I, that's, I suppose, all I mean. I don't mean to be dishonest, because I think that you are right that we shouldn't be dishonest. Another thing that was touched on was the, the, um, the difference between... not people, um, the, the dangers of people who can't tell the difference between fact and fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not just online. I mean, wh when we go to Scientific American, do you remember when Scientific American was a good journal in which you, <laughs> you found interesting scientific articles with, with evidence and facts and stuff? I mean, and, uh, you know, uh, just last week they, they published an article um, which shows that, it's, that sex is obviously not binary. And, and, I mean, it's just argued at length. And this is almost all reputable journals have, have become... Um, activist propaganda, and th that must make it very hard for people who do not spend their lives like we do studying this stuff at length. They think, oh, well, it's in Scientific American. It must be, must be true. Don't you think, Holly? What's the question? The question is whether... <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's dreaming away. Right? <laughs> <laughs> whether the fact that we have reputable, once reputable scientific journals printing garbage, that... Um, that makes it very hard for ordinary people to tell the difference between fact and fiction? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> Somebody rescue me from this. What do we I add? Do, uh, Go on, say something. No, no, I want, I have a new, I want to change the subject. OK, it? change the subject. You, do you want to...? No, no, it's, well, <laughs> unless anybody wants to say anything about what we do about these scientific journals. Um, yes. I'm, I'm, I was just going to say, I, I think that the sort of whole... Um, merging of, of fact and fiction, the whole sort of, you know, what you were talking about with the sort of the postmodern world, um, I think actually the online world is the perfect mirror of that. I think that's where, uh, you know, discourse, language, words, all the rest of it does create reality, and I think that's led through into the real world, and that's why we see nonsense such as this with Scientific America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Thank you. Holly, go on, you've got a new subject. Well, I just because we're talking about language and it's something that relates to what both of the Joes said. Um, so I think Joe Phoenix, one of the things that came up in, in your remarks was students disingenuously using the concepts of harm and distress when they mean disagreement. But there is also this conversation that I think we have to have about when there really is something like harm or hurt or or whatever else uh, in campus as a result of words, right? So there is a discussion about when language is hate speech and when language is incitement. And I'd be interested to know, maybe just by a show of hands, did anyone else get a jolt when um, Joe Bartosz used the words parasite and infest? Did anyone notice that? One person, two, three. Okay, because when I'm reading about hate speech, there's always this very bright line defended about dehumanizing language. And it's never kind of like, oh, well, think about which group, like, do they have power? Is there any risk of genocide? No, it's always just like, don't ever compare any group ever to insects. <laughs> like, don't ever, right? Don't dehumanize, don't dehumanize. But I have to say, there is a cost there, right? So if we just take the rule to be such a bright line, then you lose like emphatic, colorful, great ways to, to write and to speak and to tell stories, if there really is not, if that's not an oppressed group, there's absolutely no risk of genocide, maybe that should not be such a bright line. So I, I thought it was, in, I, for me, I got a fright when you said those two words. <laughs> I didn't, didn't put but then I was reflecting on like, maybe, yeah, what's the group you're talking about? And maybe that's perfectly I mean, fine. The, um, the group I was specifically referred to was the grievance industry. So it was talking about those who do parasitically suck off institutions by flogging absolute abject nonsense. So right. I think it's fair enough to call them parasites. And they're not at risk of genocide, no. what one might say. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, you're I mean, right, you're right, it is parasitic. Yeah. And actually there, there's, there was a, um, there was a journal, I think it was an intersectional feminist journal, which described, where the authors described their own tactics in terms of infection. They said, we need to infect uh, institutions. And so they did it to themselves. So I think it's a reasonable metaphor to deploy. Well, and what meaning uh, were you attaching to the word intersectional there, Andrew? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, well, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, 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 the original concept... Do you really want me to do this? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Do, the, go on. Well, the original concept of intersectionality is actually quite a useful one. It was developed by Kimberly exactly. Crenshaw. Uh, and, 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 and Kimberly Crenshaw's view, who, who I disagree with on a lot, but Kimberly Crenshaw's initial view was that it is possible to face discrimination from multiple fronts uh, when you belong to more than one minority group category, and she envisaged it as the intersection of kind of crossroads, where, you know, if you're a black and female, uh, you get hit by two sets of traffic rather than just if you were black or if you were female. And the example she gave was, uh, I think it was General Motors, a lawsuit, General Motors, uh, where they, they were effectively discriminating against black women, but their defence was, look, we've got all these black men, so we're not racist, we've got all these white women, so we're not sexist, so... But of course, black women were falling through the cracks. Now, yeah. actually, so I think the initial premise of intersectionality, there's a point to it. But it has become and morphed into a kind of religion where we've ended up with a kind of hierarchy of grievances. And that is not what her original intention was. So I like to make the distinction between second wave feminism, uh, which has the recognition of biological reality at the heart of it, and intersectional feminism, which has now put gender identity at the very top of this grievance hierarchy. Uh, it is the reason why... Um, when those brave women in Iran are burning their hijabs and dancing in the street, Western feminists keep quiet because they're intersectional feminists, right? And, they, and I think that's, that's, that's an important distinction because actually I think intersectional feminism and what I call real feminism are at loggerheads. Joe jo Phoenix, um, can you respond to that? Because I know I you've got indeed. a lot of views on that. Yeah, well, I do. Um, and it's whether or not Kimberly Crenshaw invented intersectionality. Popularised it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it came from the... I think it was the Black Lesbian Combahee Collective. Right. Um, and it was specifically to talk about the intersection of structural disadvantage. And uh, by the time Kimberly Crenshaw reinvented it, she attached it to identity categories. Yes. Um, and that was, that was the movement. Uh, yeah, and that's the movement I'm talking about that's yeah. become uh, yeah. perverted. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, she wasn't completely. the first to use the, uh, the concept. No, um, and but it's something that, I mean, if you look in, in the kind of the annals of Angela Y. Davis and people like that and the struggle for justice, that notion of intersectionality has been deeply embedded in our, our, our radical politics for a very long time, particularly for feminists. And I think one of the really sad things now is this notion of, inter, you know, your, your feminism has to be intersectional. And for me, as soon as I hear that, I think not only have the people who use that never done any reading, 
They've also never done any um, critical thinking. And you accept, and you, from what you're saying, you agree that that word intersectional now has the baggage of 100%. what I'm talking about. Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's actually yeah. inescapable now. Can I just yeah. say that I don't think, I, I can't, I've never seen it anywhere in the actual literature, both going back as far as you say, Joe, and, and in Crenshaw. It's not in there that it's worse to have more traits. I think that's a separate thing that's been brought in, this prioritarianism yeah. idea that we want to protect the worst off. Yeah. That's a separate idea, kind of for, in liberal theory, and it's been like mashed together without argument with the intersectional idea. Mm. And that's where you get the view that like to have three identity group traits is worse than two, yeah. and so it becomes the, the hierarchy of oppression. But I think the intersectionality idea alone doesn't get you that. No, but the way that the term is currently understood as a result of years of this kind of activism. The folk mess of the concept. Right, exactly. The folk mess. Yeah. I agree. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Okay, I'm, gonna, I, I'm just going to... I know that, they, that people can go on for a long time on this subject, and it is interesting, but we, I'm going to bring, it, bring the tone down a little bit here because so many people want to know the, uh, the, from Andrew the joke that got him sacked. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know what it was. It was a... It was a, it was a no, I don't. They wouldn't tell me. It was a tweet that Titania sent. Oh. It wasn't even me. <laughs> <laughs> Are you but seriously forgotten? I was never told what it was. I was told that it was a tweet Twitter. from the Titania McGrath account, but I was never told what the actual tweet was. So it could have been anything. Because actually, with that account, sometimes the tweets that I think are really innocuous are the ones that cause the most trouble. It's mm. a bit Kafkaesque, this, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you've committed a crime and you're not told what the crime yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. 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 So, um, we, I have a, a few questions here on the, on the, uh, the, um, the, from the audience. Um, so, somebody says, gender critical and turf are both negative, have no, negative con connotations. Can we find a positive descriptor for people who know that there are only two sexes? I don't we just call them biological Smart. realists or something? <laughs> Sorry? Uh, what did you say? Smart. Smart. <laughs> I don't think that's going to cut it, Joe. <laughs> but, uh, isn't the phrase that people use sex realist? Yeah. But that yeah. the, I think that um, the reactionary feminists have taken that over now. So now it's got the connotation of the reactionary see, feminist the opposed to the gender critical feminist. Unfortunately, so if you said I'm a sex realist feminist, you would be with uh, Louise Perry, Mary Harrington, Abigail Favala gang. So we should be careful of that implication. Now. So <laughs> you're saying that the second we claim a word, yeah. it becomes reclaimed, redefined, and we have to yeah. choose another word. Is that what you're saying? No, I think they are just trying to distinguish themselves from the gender critical feminists because they have a different view about the biology of sex, like how much sex difference there is. That's fine. They're just distinguishing themselves from us. Fine. But I'm just saying that couldn't be a substitute because <laughs> that's already taken at the moment. Yeah. Next question. <laughs> uh, somebody asks, is a language <coughs> focus on women and lesbians missing an opportunity to engage and peak. Oh, that word peak, somebody says peak oh, is a very, a word we should never not use because if you peak, it's very, you know, it's, it's polarizing. You know, you climb up the mountain, you reach the top, and then on the other hand, you become a good person. So I don't know, we can think about the language we use. But anyway, so is, if you focus on women and lesbians, um, are we missing an opportunity to engage and peak more gay men? who otherwise don't see this as something that affects them. Are we focusing too much, in other words, on women and lesbians? No. And <laughs> Oh, well, the audience definitely <laughs> doesn't think so. Um, I will go to the man on the panel to say, to ask, what? What? Right. Do it again. OK, the question from the audience there, and that person needed no microphone, <laughs> was, Shouldn't they, shouldn't gay men, is it not, and it is a problem that gay men in general um, are not terribly enthusiastic about supporting the struggle that we have here. Although I got into a terrible argument with a gay man um, the day before yesterday who said that we should stop focusing on lesbians because we, it, was, it, was, it was absolutely wrong and that it, we should be equal. And I did try very hard to explain the intersectionality of lesbians being given. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work because maybe <coughs> too much to. Anyway, um, Andrew, what do you think? Do you think, I mean, you notice presumably uh, the gay men in your surroundings a reluctance to join this, or do I you not? I don't. I notice the opposite 
but I think it might be to do with the circles I move in. I actually don't know any gay men who don't support this, so it might just be the people I hang out, out with. Uh, and I know I think there is. I know that there are a lot of gay men, you see them on, online, even in the commentaria, you know, Owen Jones and the likes, who, who don't take that view, and they claim they're in the majority uh, within the gay community. Um, is it a particular problem? I think that the reason is that so much of the attacks have been levelled at women rather than men, so women are obviously bound to notice it more, aren't they? I mean, when, when you cut, like I mentioned earlier, the Jenny Watson's lesbian speed dating event, we haven't seen a, a gay men's event being cancelled in that way yet. Um, most of the abuse online tends to go towards women. Um, I, I think it, it's that, it's that, it's people just think, not, they're not thinking outside their own experience. So I think that is important that people uh, recognise that. But having said that, I've spoke to a lot of gay men who say they're sick of Grindr now because it's full of women. <laughs> and, 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 and look, if you're a gay man, that, it's not misogynistic to say that is a turn off. <laughs> because they're not attracted to women. So, so you, know, that, you know, obviously I'm, I'm not on Grindr myself, but that, um, <laughs> that's all, you know. So I, think, I, I also think with all of this, it's just often a, a lack of understanding. Um, so for, I'll give you an example. I, I interviewed a guy called Andrew Boff, conservative uh, MP, uh, on my show a couple of weeks ago. He was the one who heckled Suella Braverman when she was talking about gender ideology, and he was shouting, there's no such thing. So I asked him on the show, what do you think she meant by gender ideology? And he didn't know. And it, what was clear was he'd never encountered this entire realm of discussion. He didn't know what gender ident identity ideology meant, what it entailed, what activists were appealing for. He, he wasn't coming at it from a place of malevolence, or he certainly wasn't anti-gay or anti-trans or anything. Like, he was coming at it from a place of complete ignorance. He just didn't, and I mean that not in a, a pejorative sense. Yeah. He literally did not know. And I think most people in the, in the LGB, whatever you want, most gay people just don't know what gender ident identity ideology means and, and the threat that it represents to their own interests. Mm. Yeah, okay. well, I mean, we do have a problem, I think, with, with, with gay male celebrities. Um, gay male celebrities who really, um, I think, do know what's going on and actually take the opportunity to, to, to pour scorn and deride and uh, are some of the most offensive uh, pe uh, people who are attacking us. And that's very painful. That is very painful. Yeah. And it, it's very hard um, to know how to counter that. Um, and gay politicians. And, and, yeah, gay politicians in, in, yeah, in most parties, yeah. Um, somebody wants to know that, um, this is an interesting question, um, does the panel agree that there was a time that employers or government or scholars were, were the guardians of language, but that it's now down to us? It's now down to us to be the guardians of language. That's interesting. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I don't know. I mean, does language have... Does, language doesn't work like that, does it, guardians? No, no I, I don't think it does, but I can understand where the question comes from because at some point or at one point, lang uh, uh, scholars, politicians, the, the elite <coughs> intelligentsia would have possessed a language and used that uh, in a way that often excluded others. And I don't mean excluded like inclusion and in exclusion. I mean, literally, uh, the, the, the knowledge that sits behind that was not democratized. Um, and, you know, we have seen a shift, haven't we, in, where in a lot of these very erudite and, you know, kind of abstract ideas are now becoming democratized. Um, so, you know, people can engage in a discussion about post-structuralism and post-modernism now in a way that they never could do when I was doing my PhD, which did draw on post-modernism and post-structuralism. Um, you know, so there is a, an extent to which there's a democratization of some of this stuff, but in terms of who's the guardian of it, that's altogether different, and it depends on, I think, anyway, on what forum in which we're using this language and to what effect. Everything is context, isn't it? Everything, everything is, is context, context, but everything is also goal. I mean, you know, it, it, Joe Bartosz is fighting a, a war that she wants to win, and I am not always sure whether using that language is 
is going to be helpful to appeal to the vast majority of people who, I quite agree with Andrew, are simply ignorant. They don't know anything about all this. And you start talking about a war, they think, oh, I don't want to... I mean, I, I, I'm not at all sure that using that... It, it, it depends what your goal is. What is your goal? I'm, I'm going to take... A, I'd like you to think about ways forward while I have a look and see if there are any questions from the audience. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, are, you, are you still awake over there? Um, yeah. No, I, I, I meant that in the friendliest possible way. It predates Crenshaw and the intersection. Talks about it should be black and blue now. Okay. You know the one I mean? I do. So. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the uh, enthusiastic person here. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing a Hermione. Um, my name's Bronwyn Winter. My pronouns are fabulously stunning, Dyke. And Holly, you see what I did there? I took a tail, a set of ears and a nose, and called them legs. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to thank Joe for mentioning the Combahee River Collective. Dead right. The term wasn't used before Crenshaw, but the concept was there. We are going to get a yeah, question. But right? I'm going to ask a question right now. I just wanted to mention that because I really appreciated you mentioning that. Um, my question is, I was thinking about disinformation campaigns. Now, the political class, ruling classes, have always waged different information campaigns in real politique and, you know, winning wars and so on and so forth. But it occurs to me that of late we have this escalation of disinformation, not just about gender identity ideology. We can think of Brexit. We can think of debates about vaccination. We can think of weapons uh -huh. of mass destruction and so on. Um, so I'm wondering, I'm also painfully reminded of the disinformation campaign in the lead up to the Indigenous Voice to Parliament referendum, which was recently lost in Australia. Yeah, can you so I'm, I'm asking the question. I have to set the context. <laughs> so I, I'm asking the panel whether you think this is a disinformation mixing up facts to fiction that is solely limited to this area, or whether you think there's a more general problem a more general political and information disinformation problem with which this is linked. Okay, is that clear? Well, are we dealing with a sex and gender issue or are we dealing with a, with a more general... <laughs> I'm not um, saying we're not dealing with it, but is it part of a wider part context? Part of what a, a, a general disinformation. Who wants to answer that? I don't mind. Yeah, go on. Starting, if you like. Um, uh, to, to be brief, I think it's uh, a consequence of the shift to, to online living. I think this is a product of social media, and I think it's that disengagement from our bodies that is driving it. That doesn't quite answer the question, though, does it? I mean, do you think it is part of, a, of, a, of a broader yes. disinformation, world of disinformation? Or yes, I think... I, I, I think oh, well, yeah, well, yeah, with regards to... I don't, I don't think you can um, pull out any one campaign, I think, whether it's gender <laughs> identity or whether it's um, some of the... Um, sort of mad stuff that's being spouted about critical race theory. I think it's all the same, sort of um, uh, distanced from reality, um, very tribalistic sort of way of looking at things that I think is a product of the online world. Thank you. Rob? Yes. Hello. Sorry. Doesn't... Hello? Ah, oh, perfect. Um, hello, uh, Robert Jess Jessel here. Um, very quick question. I was very taken by the word uh, parasitical, and I agree um, completely with Holly that we don't, do not want, want to use this word about individuals. I was just wondering, what word do we use to describe the entire industry that has grown up around EDI that has, I would say, infected H HR departments, and whose, whose purpose is to not only stop us speaking, but to stop us, uh, as Andrew made the point about nine, nine, 1984, if you control language, you can control thought, too. So what words can we use not only to describe uh, these in industries, but what words can we use to fight back against their own manipulation of language. Mm. Okay, I'm going to ask each of you. Um, Andrew, start. Uh, well, so I don't think the response to the manipulation of language is to manipulate language ourselves. <laughs> I think the response is to expose uh, the lack of clarity within the, the language that they choose to use. So, for instance, uh, we have now um, uh, various people in the commentariat, in the political class, uh, in HR departments telling us that we should use the word cisgender. They define the word cisgender as one whose gender identity does not align with one's sex assigned at birth. That's the phrase they use. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that most of us don't have a gender identity or indeed believe in a gender identity. And therefore, the word cisgender is incoherent. 
to apply to the people to whom it is applied. Yeah. Now, if you explain that to someone, then, they'll say, then most sensible people will say, OK, in that case, you're right, I won't use the word cisgender because it doesn't make sense unless you believe in the philosophy behind it. Um, similarly, when I saw those Labour MPs holding up that sign saying we need a ban on trans conversion therapy, um, and of course, this is an example of what you said, that I think these people just haven't thought it through because that sounds like they're right. There should be... A, there, you it sounds like a horrible thing. Yeah, exactly. You don't want that. You don't, oh, I must ban it. But yeah. as we all know... Uh, Trans, if you oppose trans conversion therapy, you are effectively promoting gay conversion therapy. Yes. Mm. But they don't know. The people holding that signs don't. The signs don't know that because activists are playing their language games. Mm. So I think the key is not to come up with more inventive uh, manipulations of language, but to explain what is meant behind the concepts that the activists deploy. Yeah. I think that's the most effective strategy. But uh, what, what you're saying there, I mean, I wish that. Works, but it seems to me that we're operating in a world in which reason and arguments don't cut it. We're, it's emotion that seems to prevail again and again. So even if you explain something very, very carefully with good rational arguments, if somebody says, but then I will kill myself, um, or I'm going to, I need to emigrate because of this genocide, that somehow prevails and people don't hear the facts, I mean, do you, would you agree with that or, or, or not? I would, but I just want to come back to the EDI question, uh, if you don't mind. So um, uh, shortly after I was cancelled at Essex um, and informed that I was blacklisted, I contacted the faculty EDI lead at the Open University um, and I asked a really simple question. And the question was, when did we stop fighting for anti-discrimination and start fighting for inclusion um, and diversity and equality. Now, as it happened, that message that I sent was seen as being harmful, right, strangely. Um, but I come back to that time and again because I think some of the language that we have, we do need clarity. Yeah. And what we need is actually some clarity about what the purpose of these things are. So if we go back to thinking about uh, the, this, this industry as actually not being something that's trying to produce inclusion, diversity, and equality, but trying to stop discrimination, then it brings us right back to the thing that you were talking about before, Andrew, and that's the liberal values. Because if we're fighting discrimination, what we are actually fighting for is tolerance of the other, um, you know, just automatically. So I think back to the question about how do we talk about the parasitic EDI, we stop giving weight to EDI and we start talking about the principles that sit underneath it. Okay. Can I ask um, I, 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 one final sentence that you think will give us hope for our, our fight forward? Would each of you like to say something positive about how we're going to go forward? And please don't say fuck anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, Holly? Uh, yeah, I guess I would just say uh, fight for the language you really care about. So, uh, and that might be the language that we just cannot pursue our politics without. So pick your hill to die on and start thinking about creative alternatives to the words that our political enemies have already successfully stolen from us because we still need to be able to talk about the world um, that they've taken the words for. Thank you. Joe? I just want to say fuck now because you talk about Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is what I call inflexibility. <laughs> um, Joe? I think the, the only thing I'd say is that the conditions of change are constantly changing. And if we are attentive to that and we remain true to those liberal principles, then there will be at some point the sunny uplands of the future. Yeah. 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 Thank you. And, and wrap up, Andrew, say something wise to wrap us up. So, so, something optimistic. Something yes. positive. Uh, we're all doomed. No, uh, <laughs> no, I think the thing to remember uh, at all times in all of these debates is that there are huge swathes of the population who are generally decent, liberal-minded people who, if they understood what was going on, would be very much on our side. And so when you're in those tw Twitter spats and all the other thing, just remember not the people you're arguing with, all those other people watching. Yeah. Because, and, and choose your language carefully, because if you descend into the mud, with, with, the, with the people you're arguing with, other people will see that and they'll think you're the same. Yeah. So retaining the moral high ground is what we do. Very good. I want to thank you all. What a magnificent panel you were. We touched on some incredibly complicated, difficult subjects and I thought you were all brilliant. Thank you so much for being with us.